hopes to disseminate and democratize uh, some of the information that's available uh, to make it access to the general public, to journalists, and uh, to any others interested in doing some further analysis. Uh, now, the importance of SOEs, uh, you can see they are a fairly significant uh, you know, uh, component of your economy. They, the turnover makes up 13.7% of GDP. The combined losses which contribute to your deficit is about 6.1% of your deficit, uh, there's a 7.6% contribution uh, to the profits, uh, 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 which is a plus. Uh, the SOE debt contributes to part of your public debt problem. Uh, so basically you're dealing, the crisis we face today is a crisis of, uh, uh, of public finance mismanagement and uh, uh, managing the uh, SOEs uh, is one way of attacking that problem. Now, I think the previous presentation uh, uh, looked at uh, uh, how this problem can be addressed. The fundamental problem is that the government has been spending more than it earns, and it's been using debt and money printing to uh, finance the uh, deficit. Now, one part of the answer, of course, is, uh, is tax. So that's uh, one way you can try to cover the deficit. But um, uh, the government expenditure, both current and recurrent, are also, uh, I think, very important. Uh, uh, because uh, what we have is uh, there's a problem with the quality of government spending. There's a, the, the spending that, you, uh, that the government does uh, does not uh, result in quality public services. If anybody has tried to use the uh, uh, the uh, free public health care uh, system uh, or uh, gone through the uh, public schooling system. Uh, 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 and if you look at the amount of uh, money that people uh, spend on, uh, on private hospitals and on private tuition, uh, you're uh, free at the point of uh, delivery. Public services are supplemented by a lot of the people themselves have taken uh, are making a choice to spend something more. So the question is, your government spending, is it resulting in, uh, in, um, uh, in quality public services? Now, there's a uh, problem that uh, a lot of people see to be uh, having that uh, the current crisis, which I see from the protesters, uh, the financial crisis is due to a problem of corruption. Uh, corruption is definitely a part of the problem. And at a philosophical level, uh, uh, what has happened is the whole public policy-making process has been perverted. Uh, but uh, even if we stop corruption full stop today, that uh, your problem does not end. The reason is you have commitments which are based on your past policies. One is the debt and the interest, which has to be paid. Uh, okay, you've defaulted on the foreign debt, you haven't yet defaulted on the local debt, uh, but even after restructuring, you, you're going to have to pay back at least some component of your interest and your capital. Then you also have your public sector workforce, which was 800,000 in the early 2000s. It's grown to 1.5 million uh, uh, today. Uh, now, that eats up about 86, the pen, plus you've got 600,000 pensioners. So you've got, uh, uh, so the combined salaries and pensions is about 86% of your uh, revenue in, in 2020. Uh, interest payments are about 71% of revenue. So, uh, uh, so even if you have zero corruption, you've got all these, uh, 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 the problems of the interest and the problems of the public servants to deal with. Now, uh, you can work on these problems. The government is trying to work on the debt, but, uh, but that uh, uh, alone is not going to help because these are the solutions to a prob problem of overstaffing in the public service, uh, which has been done purely uh, for electoral purposes. The way you win election is give jobs. Right? So this is why uh, it has been a popular uh, thing over the last uh, 20 years, but to reverse that is going to be very complicated and very time-consuming. 
and very, very difficult politically. So uh, one of the, and especially so since the, you know, the government monopolizes so many critical sectors, uh, a strike in the port can cripple the country, which happened very often in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, the energy sector, the power, the, uh, the fuel, uh, all of these are near monopolies of the government. So, uh, so you can't uh, really reduce your public sector workforce drastically without triggering some other consequences. So these are difficult uh, reforms to do. Uh, the easier reform uh, is to reform some of the SOEs, especially since there's a lot of, uh, uh, lot of uh, public support now for some of the uh, big white elephants like, uh, like the airline. Now, what this report tries to do is it tries to bring some measures of performance. Uh, both financial and non-financial, it gives you a scorecard which, uh, uh, which ranks the, the 52 SOEs on the basis of what, uh, uh, what, uh, how transparent and how informative uh, they are. One of the key measures that uh, uh, has been used uh, to measure the financial uh, indicators uh, is the return on assets measure. Now, return on assets is not a perfect measure, but it's something that holistically captures overall performance uh, of how resources are being used, and um, it looks at both income and your asset base, which is uh, quite important from the government uh, uh, perspective. Uh, now, the government has no uh, benchmark or target financial rate of return uh, that it expects from its SOE. So what the report re uses is, um, is the cost of, the average cost of government borrowing. So there, now any government activity will displace some private activity. It may be consumption, uh, it may be, uh, it may be uh, private investment. So, uh, so we need to measure uh, what your uh, investments in your public sector uh, SOEs are going to uh, generate against some uh, some metric. So, in the absence of uh, of uh, stated government metric, we've used uh, the average cost of debt, uh, which is about uh, seven and a half percent over the last five years. Uh, uh, the the basically the interest cost divided by the by the uh, 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 by the outstanding debt uh, uh, to uh, give us a benchmark to measure. Uh, the return. So when we look at the uh, SOEs, um, they've done a nice little chart here. Of the 52, uh, you'll see the uh, ones on the ranked in order of average performance over the last five years. You'll see that uh, at the, at the, right at the end are the worst performers, and in, in red where they are negative, and uh, towards the right, you get the ones that have a positive return. The, the red line r running across horizontally represents the 7.5% uh, uh, average cost of debt uh, that the government uh, 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 is borrowing at. So if you look, uh, more than half the SOEs are actually uh, uh, showing a negative return, uh, and uh, only a handful, about eight, are actually uh, earning uh, uh, something in excess of the uh, government uh, cost of borrowing. Now, the cost of borrowing alone is not perhaps the, always the, uh, it's an indicator, uh, but we, the report also has some um, uh, ROA comparisons where available with the private sector and with the, uh, let me see if I can find this slide. Yes, with some of the uh, private sector and some of the regional com uh, uh, comparators. Now, again, the private sector, because, uh, for example, the banking sector, the most profitable uh, uh, set of SOEs uh, uh, that the government has, they report huge absolute levels of profit. But if you look at the ROA, uh, it's about 1% uh, 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 at the Bank of Ceylon. Uh, at the People's Bank, it's about 1.3%. Uh, uh, but 
uh, if you compare some of those with the, uh, with the private banks, uh, although they're a lot smaller, is it, uh, they show a, uh, a higher rate of uh, return. I, I can't seem to find the slide, but, uh, but it's in the report. So, uh, so there are some comparisons with, uh, uh, with how the, uh, with the private sector as well as the uh, government cost of debt. Now, the purpose of this apart of the website is to provide information. The, uh, the sort of overall thrust of the report is to, one is to draw public attention towards the performance and of SOEs, uh, highlight the absence of targets for performance measurement, the lack of information and the inability to evaluate them more deeply, and more fundamentally to pose a question as to what role the government should be playing in the economy. Now, if you look at the history of the banking sector, uh, at independence, Sri Lanka had a few uh, foreign commercial banks. It was very difficult for the average Sri Lankan to get a loan. Opening a bank account was very difficult. So it makes sense in the 1960s, for, from the point of view of financial inclusion, to set up the People's Bank, to, uh, to set up rural credit uh, and thrift societies, to lend to the public, to... Uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to promote uh, savings and to, uh, uh, to give people a safe place to save. Uh, it made sense for the state to intervene. But today, uh, with further liberalization of the banking sector, uh, virtually everybody has access to a bank account. Uh, uh, with uh, microcredit, which has got to uh, some dangerous stages and needs to be carefully regulated, uh, there is perhaps too easy access to debt, but there are uh, three even through the uh, regular banking and uh, uh, banking and finance system, uh, uh, people have access to debt. So, is it really necessary for the uh, the rationale for the state to own state banks? Does that exist anymore? It's a question that um, uh, that I think needs to be asked. Similarly, with the petroleum corporation, when the when the Shell, SO, and Caltex were nationalized the petroleum distribution. The government wanted to control the commanding heights of the economy. In 1969, they thought the government could earn a lot of revenue by building a refinery as well. You can see what, how, that, how well that's turned out. I don't know what contribution that has made, but there's been a huge amount of accumulated losses in the petroleum corporation. Now, thanks to the fact that you've got one private player, and if the foreign exchange problem were eased a little bit, you might be able to still get uh, fuel from LIOC. Does the government really have a role in the distribution of fuel? What really is the role that the government should play? Now, the, if you look at what the protesters have been complaining about, there is a lack of accountability, right? Uh, there is a disconnect between what the public want and how the government is acting, right? If you have a government that's not representative, if you have a government that's not accountable, right? How can you get this government to run things for your benefit, right? And if uh, if so, should what really should the government be doing? Uh, so there are some fairly fundamental questions that you can uh, that you can ask uh, based on, uh, 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 and uh, I think we should be asked. And uh, we hope the uh, report and the website will help. Uh, the public to ask some of the hard questions from uh, the politicians. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ratna Sabapati, for that very comprehensive presentation. We have now released our latest public policy product on state-owned enterprises, a web platform tracking the latest analysis on SOE performance. You will see it on our screen in a while. You can access the website on www.soe.lk. We will now break for tea and recommence our next panel at 4 o'clock.
Hello, good evening everyone. Welcome back to the live stream studio. You're joining us back at the live stream studio of the Reform Now conference organized by Advocata Institute Sri Lanka under the theme, Let's Reset Sri Lanka. And you must have um, enjoyed the whole conference today. A lot of thoughts to be taken, thought leaders and experts coming in to talk about their expertise. And before we move forward, and this is the tea break we are taking to have discussion on something very important. And before we move forward to that, I think it's time for us to say congratulations to Advocata Institute on stepping into a milestone today by launching their state-owned enterprises in Sri Lanka, the web platform, and also launching their two reports, the main report of uh, State of the SOE in Sri Lanka 2022, and also the report on SOE governance and consolidation plan. Um, talking about SOEs, state-owned enterprises, ladies and gentlemen, we all know they, SOEs, play a major role in the Sri Lankan economy. And right now, we're talking about SOEs. Why? Because we're all in an economic crisis. And we believe the inefficient management of SOEs is also one reason which has all led us into this situation. Starting off with SOEs, for example, we are all going through the fuel crisis. Fuel, gas, electricity. These three words we keep hearing every day and we are facing this crisis. And this is exactly why we need to have as public we all need to have access to the right information and it's important to analyze the performance of soes in sri lanka and see whether they're being a burden to the economy or whether they're really adding or contributing to the economy in any state so coming into sri lankan economic crisis this is an important um, turnover important roundabout that we are at right now so Right now, the certain problems I would like to highlight is the information towards SOEs. Who's really responsible for this? The Public Enterprise Department, which falls under the Ministry of Finance, is responsible for the information of the state-owned enterprises. But we feel right now the inefficient management or the crisis management of, of this has led us all into this situation. And it's important to highlight the uh, key factors that are going towards this. And in such a crisis situation where we don't have enough uh, lack of information to SOEs and also lack of accessibility to the information of SOEs, uh, this is the problem that is being sorted by Advocata Institute Sri Lanka by bringing in this SOE web platform where we can all access and see where we are heading to and they're analyzing the performance to say where Sri Lanka can lead to. With that introduction, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce uh, an eminent uh, speaker. I would say somebody who has got involved in this research of SOEs throughout. None other than I would like to introduce the research assistant of Avocata Institute, and she is specialized in this SOE research, Ms. Anuka Ratnaika. Hello, Anuka. Hi. So welcome to the live stream studio for, this, for our chat today. And to start with the conversation, I would like to ask you, let's lay the foundation, talking a little bit about SOEs and SOE reforms. Yes. Uh, to, let's talk a little bit about its history, because we know we had a uh, lot of gaps with no information in country and its journey. Let's just yes. lay a foundation. So as we all know, the Ministry of Finance or the Treasury categorizes SOEs and names them uh, as uh, there are 52 strategic SOEs. But according to the Advocata's findings, we have almost 527 SOEs. But uh, we have information on 399 SOEs uh, on our web platform. So that's like a basic context. And talking about the history, so uh, state-owned enterprises were were established in Sri Lanka even prior to 1955. So uh, after 1955, there was a quite an inward-looking policy program that took place in the country. Yeah. But after that, we saw the first wave of privatization coming into play. And after that, all, uh, after that, that is uh, after the 1989, we see a second wave of privatization, which comes out really strong, and a lot of uh, state-owned businesses, public enterprises, were privatized. So, uh, 
in 1997, we see a very important incident mm -hmm. in the history of SOEs, that is the SLT, the Sri Lanka Telecom, being privatized, and that itself is a success story. Even today, a lot of customers go to the SLT, and also there's a, there's a high profit, and uh, the performance is very uh, impressive of the of Sri Lanka Telecom because of that privatization. And during the same time, we also see uh, a partial privatization of Sri Lankan Airlines, but uh, but uh, unfortunately that was that was brought back in 2008 due to uh, due to certain reasons. Mm -hmm. So like that, uh, SOEs have been uh, privatization of SOEs have been taken up at several instances, but also they've been reversed due to various political reasons as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much, Anuka, for laying the foundation. I think it's important as public because um, experts might come and speak at the conference and a lot of uh, thought leaders. And like we said at the start itself, policymakers, think tank leaders and uh, decision makers, business community will come up here and talk at the conference. Uh, uh, but... What's important is all of us, the citizens of Sri Lanka, are getting together to decide to reset Sri Lanka. When we say let's reset Sri Lanka, it is to say that we all get together. And having that in mind, talking about SOEs back in topic, uh, Aditya, you also have been part of this research. And I would like to happily hand over the control to you to talk a little bit about this as well. Aditya? Yes, sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so what I uh, basically adding on to what Anuka just talked about, I think one of the main things that our viewers should know is that it's not just about the losses. See, when you look at the, uh, the free market, mm -hmm. the free market has a specific purpose, right, in terms of allocating resources in society. Right. And what it does is basically all the inefficient firms are pushed out by the market process itself. Mm -hmm. But when the state steps in and has these SOEs which incur huge losses, mm -hmm. but then either by borrowing from foreign governments or by sort of... Um, uh, pumping in taxpayer money or by printing money yeah. when the SOEs are just uh, funded again and again despite their inefficiencies, what we see uh, happening is that actually you are subsidizing an inefficient allocation of resources. Right. That translates to a massive wastage of the productive mm -hmm. capacity of the country. Okay. Not just that, but you're also, uh, you're also taking up an anti-competitive stance within the market. And that mm -hmm. really... Uh, brings about a lot of macroeconomic issues uh, to the country. Now, on that, since Anuka and I were both engaged in this, uh, in this uh, research uh, quite extensively, I would like to actually get her take on what she thinks are the structural inefficiencies of these SOEs. We can actually uh, maybe pick a couple of SOEs and just dig down. Yes. yes. So, uh, we're talking about SOEs today because of the structural inefficiencies and the issues that it has created. And that is one reason why we, we want SOEs, we, we want a privatization program for these SOEs. So talking about uh, structural inefficiencies, starting with uh, market pricing, lack of market pricing, the best two examples I can give is the Ceylon Electricity Board and also Sri Lanka Railways. There's a, there's a huge mismatch between the real price and the, the, the price that the consumer pays. So there's a huge subsidy uh, that is given to a lot of consumers, even though it's not a targeted uh, subsidy. So that is one uh, structural inefficiency. And also, uh, there, are, there are a few other inefficiencies, like corruption, which we all discuss. And also, uh, when we talk about uh, the, other, the, the rest of the inefficiencies, there are issues with the management and also uh, uh, different uh, issues. Like I think uh, you can add to this also. Yes, uh, I yes. think one issue, one main issue we had was the lack of financial accountability because yes. we, we actually uh, experienced in terms of collecting information that not a lot of, in, uh, I think close to about 15% of the SOEs uh, had did annual reports. Annual uh, yeah. reports. Yes, yeah. exactly. And also, uh, we did not, uh, we were not able to find PED reports yes. up 2018. So that itself is a problem because the PED is the authority which is responsible for uh, the public enterprises. So uh, they need to release information for the public to know about how the SOEs perform because it's basically that the SOEs run based on public money or the taxes that the public pay. So People should know what's happening. The accountability aspect is not seen in most of these uh, in most of these cases. So that itself is a structural issue. 
Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, that is very well understood by what from what you said, Anuka. And just like you said, it's amazing that how Advocata Institute has stepped in. And like I said, this is a milestone. It's a significant moment where when there is a responsible authority, the institute has stepped in to take over this responsibility and provide for the society, provide for Sri Lanka, the Sri Lankan economy, and give the right information. Because we know we all need to know the truth. This is what we've all been fighting for. And we need to know where we're heading as a country. So each category of under uh, state-owned enterprises, it has an effect because you're, you're standing in queues today, you're standing uh, at uh, you know uh, fuel stations, you're staying for hours and hours. We need to know the truth, and this is where it has to come from. And as they mentioned, uh, certain annual reports have not really come out for the recent years. What really happened to them? From now on, we should be um, responsible, and Advocata is taking the responsibility of putting out the transparency to the public. I think that's very important. And going forward, I would like to ask Anuka the question. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the burden of state-owned enterprises on the Treasury of Sri Lanka focusing more towards the debt crisis? Sure. So, uh, according to the Central Bank Annual Report of 2021, as far as I remember, public guaranteed debt mm -hmm. was close to 1.8 trillion. Right. So, public guaranteed debt basically means the debt that the Treasury guarantees for public enterprises. Mm -hmm. So, main contributors for public guaranteed debt is mainly CPC, the Ceylon Petroleum Corporation, C, uh, the Ceylon Electricity Board, Sri Lankan Airlines, and a few more SOEs. Yeah. So uh, that itself is a burden to the Treasury uh, because the government, uh, the government uh, uh, guarantees for the debt that these state-owned enterprises take and therefore uh, the debt restructuring process. So as we all know that with, uh, the economic crisis of Sri Lanka is led by a debt crisis. Mm. So the debt crisis is worsened because of the SOE debt as well. There, there are so many types of debts, rupee sure. denominated debt, dollar denominated debt, and also foreign, and also there are debt of other foreign currency sorts. So uh, this is a real burden on the treasury right. because most of these SOEs who has borrowed on treasury guarantees are loss making. Mm -hmm. Like if you take Sri Lankan Airlines for example, they made a loss of 171 billion in 2021 according to the Ministry of Finance annual report. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like that, most of the SOEs which borrow from the Treasury are loss-making. Mm -hmm. So, that is the main issue that uh, SOEs face. Right, okay. Um, yes, so uh, I think just building up on one thing that Anuka just mentioned, we're not suggesting that the same policy solution of privatization would work across the board for all SOEs. Um, Technically, taking something like CEB, there are certain functions that uh, that aren't really uh, there. There are certain elements of natural monopolies which the state has to sort of uh, come in and uh, you know sort of execute. So uh, the central function of the CEB, which uh, has uh, which has a colossal investment uh, and uh, a very high sunk cost, basically we call it in economics. Uh, that part might not be actually privatizable, but you can go for things like unbundling and restructuring of um, you know, these massive uh, mon uh, monopolistic and oligopolistic SOEs mm -hmm. such that the efficiency is uh, sort of um, you know, improved. And while on the subject of efficiency, I think it's really important that our viewers know, one of the key uh, sort of um, uh, the metrics that we've used to rank the SOEs uh, has a lot to do with uh, efficiency. So I think Anuka could actually walk our audience through uh, what that metric is and how it applies to our SOE rankings. Sure, yes. So uh, when you refer to the web platform, you see a ranking which is basically based on the return on assets uh, of, the, of each SOE. So return on assets itself is a performance indicator which measures the efficiency of an SOE. Uh, the, the amount an SOE uh, gets as a return based on, their, uh, based on the asset base they have. So uh, based on Based on that, we have come up with a, a financial uh, equation and calculated the ROA for each year and got an average ROA for the six years for which we collected data for. And, uh, and based on that ROA, we look at all the 52 SOEs as one portfolio of government investment and has ranked them from 1 to 52. 
So uh, also we've color coded them so that the viewer can easily understand what are good and what are bad and what are moderately performing. So that's basically how we have uh, ranked the, the SOEs based on ROE. Thank you so much for that answer as well, Anuka. Um, I would like to take up the final uh, question of, I think uh, it's time, the tea break is almost over. So before we move, uh, cut forward to the main session, I would like to ask you one question as to, now you might have faced personally so many challenges developing this research and throughout this research. I would like to know some of the challenges that you faced uh, through this research. Yes, of course, uh, the major issue, Ashin Sani, like you mentioned in the beginning, was the lack of information. It was very hard for us to find information due to the lack of uh, unavailability of annual reports and also the PED reports special, mm -hmm. specially. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, one main limitation that we had uh, when, when calculating financial performance indicators and also gathering data. So uh, other than that, when, uh, when, we, when we were assessing governance indicators, the other limitations we came across was uh, the right to information information. Mm -hmm. So on an act itself, the government has, the, the law has enforced the right to information act so uh, all SOEs and public enterprises are liable to give us information, but unfortunately uh, only few SOEs has replied to the RTIs that we have filed. So those were a few of the mistakes that I can think of right now. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the challenges that we faced. Uh, but lack of information was the real big challenge, which also had uh, impacts, which also had a ripple effect on the other challenges that we faced on the project. Yeah. Yes. That's amazing to hear. I'm sure you definitely overcame all those challenges. You found a way out and that is the success story we are sharing today. You all launched the SOE web platform and also the two main uh, reports. Um, so going forward, I would like to ask another question that is um, talking about this whole uh, situation of SOEs and you have done this research, you have been part of this research and as an individual, as a citizen of Sri Lanka, I think we all have the right to thought, uh, right for opinion. So what is your point of view after doing the research? Do you think Sri Lanka, we can have hope and by resolving this factor only into SOEs, can we um, expect something positive? Yes, uh, so on that take, I think Advocata has done uh, a lot of videos mm -hmm. and also created content on the crisis itself. Mm -hmm. So it's not only about one reform, yeah. it's about several reforms coming up together. So state owned enterprise is one critical reform that uh, Sri Lanka should take to reduce the burden on its fiscal sector. So that's just one, but there are so many other reforms mm -hmm. that you can, uh, we, that Sri Lanka has to do and uh, move the way forward if we want to gain economic prosperity and come out of this economic crisis. Yeah, I think uh, time to time we keep coming into the conclusion that we all can have hope as Sri Lankans. It's, it's about having that single drop of hope that will drive us a long way. Um, having, be, having that being said, I think we have a little bit more time before we cut to the main session. Uh, so Aditya, would you like to uh, add on to the SOE segment? Yes, just adding on to this brilliant conversation that Anuka and you were having. I think uh, it's actually... Um, it's actually very ironic that uh, the state of the state-owned enterprises actually has a lot to do, uh, it, it can be juxtaposed with uh, the current trajectory of the Sri Lankan economy. Mm -hmm. Because if you, there's this very interesting book that Anuka and I actually uh, we, we, uh, researched quite a bit on mm -hmm. called The Colonial Economy on Track. It was basically a book that uh, analyzed um, the... Uh, the sort of the, uh, the, the the growth of the Sri Lankan railway system, and I encourage all our viewers to go out, uh, go and read this book because it will it will sort of give you a better un uh, understanding about how these uh, SOEs were run very well, very efficiently way back uh, during uh, during uh, the colonial era, and what exactly happened during the post-colonial era that dragged uh, departments like uh, the Sri Lankan uh, railway department. Uh, down to uh, the very precarious uh, financial position it is in right now. Ashinsi? Thank you, uh, Aditya. I think on that note, we are ready to move into the main session. So, Panel discussion. Presently in Sri Lanka, state-owned enterprises are gazetted under various ministries which are fraught with inherent conflicts of interest. The respective ministries are policymakers and, in some instances, the regulators as well. 
Therefore, we have to ask, should SOEs be managed and owned under a single government-owned conglomerate like structure to improve performance, capital allocation, and governance? To answer this question, we first have Daniel Alphonsus to make a presentation before we commence the panel discussion. Uh, where's the presentation? I can start it now. Let's just test this and see. Good afternoon, everybody. So we all know intuitively that ownership matters. And that's what this conversation is about, how ownership can be used to improve the performance of SOEs, and what are the ownership functions in particular. So in this presentation, what I'm going to do is very briefly lay out the different forms of ownership and ownership functions and control, and then let the panelists discuss this uh, further in, in terms of making an argument of how this can actually be done here. I'm also going to touch upon the Sri Lankan context as well. So what I'd like to start with is this slide, which shows the performance of an SOE versus a private company. And this SOE is SRT, which as we all know, is one of the best performing SOEs. It's sort of a, 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 a leading light in the SOE constellation. And that's partly because it was privatized, partly because there was a great deal of competition introduced, and partly because it benefited from a management contract with one of the world's leading telecommunication providers. But despite all of this, if you look at uh, the chart here, you can see very clearly that over time, uh, over a considerable period of time, the performance of SLT as a group has been significantly lower than its competitor. And this is particularly concerning because SLT also benefits from monopoly status in certain sectors, for example, in the fixed line and fiber sectors, uh, until relatively recently, at least on fiber. Um, so ownership clearly matters, and there's different ways in which ownership can be structured if you look at SOEs. So you can have either a highly decentralized structure where operations, financial control, management appointments are vested with a particular line ministry. Um, then you can have a highly centralized approach where there's a, a single holding company that makes these decisions. In other words, appoints the directors, uh, appoints uh, the, the key management personnel, engages in financial control, and makes operational decisions as well sometimes. And then in between, you have various hybrid uh, options where, for example, even though the primary operational responsibility is with the line ministry, you might have the Ministry of Finance have a representative on the board or perform some type of monitoring or financial control function. And in other cases where there is a SOE monitoring or oversight body that might perform those roles. So what does it look like in Sri Lanka? In Sri Lanka, um, if we look at SOEs, I'm going to cover a few areas. The first is the legal personality of, of SOEs. We see we have a diverse range of legal personalities. We have government departments, we have boards, we have statutory corporations, we have public companies, we have private limited companies, we have public limited companies, and the examples are there for you to see. 
In terms of ownership, we don't have a single SOE holding company, but we do have now a cluster SOE holding company in the form of Selandiva, which holds some hotels. We have the treasury owning SOEs, we, and we have line ministries as well. In terms of control, we have cases where the government is the sole shareholder, a majority shareholder, a controlling shareholder, a minority shareholder, and in some cases a golden shareholder, where the state's level of control uh, is greater than what, what would one would have purely from the shares that it holds. In terms of voting power, it, those are exercised directly by the state holding uh, shares, or indirectly by the state acting as a trustee for, uh, for example, EPF funds or life insurance, in the case of uh, SLIC, life insurance uh, members' funds, or uh, hybrid holdings as well, where there's a mixture of both. And the market structures in which they operate are also diverse. You have natural monopolies, you have regulatory monopolies where the monopoly is sort of enforced by regulation. You have cases where there is a single buyer that is the state, so uh, for example, electricity, um, and you have competitive markets as well. And then the regulatory framework, again, is similarly diverse. You have cases where the regulator is also the party that, uh, that is engaged in the operations or, or the enterprise itself. You have specialized regulators, you have multi-sector regulators, and you have line ministries. So what we can see is, I'm not sure if you can see this very clearly, is these all interact with each other as well. So you have this huge, confusing array of ownership, control, shareholding, and uh, market structure. And then, of course, some of these are listed on the stock exchange and not listed as well, so, uh, which generates particular disclosure requirements. So what we see from here, I, I don't want to go into the details, is just a huge amount of diversity and confusion. Um, and from this also results competing goals for any given SOE. They have different masters they need to please. There is no clear uh, structure. There is no clarity of information. And it, there is just general chaos. Now, before I hand over to the panel, one thing I'd like to also briefly introduce is the Treasury's Public Enterprise Department. Because this is the, the, the main body that provides oversight to SOEs in the country. Um, so it, it performs a monitoring role and a coordination role. And as you can see, it's a fairly small department. You've got a director general, you've got four additional director generals, and maybe two or three dozen uh, officers underneath them. And this, this is the body that is providing oversight for all the SOEs uh, in the country. And so far, it, it has not proved to be as effective as some of the other um, structures, which I'm sure some of the panelists will discuss. So I'd like to invite the panel now uh, to come up, and while they're walking up, perhaps I shall introduce them in the interests of time. So we have with us today um, a captain of industry, a veteran captain of industry, if I may add, um, Mr. Ajit Gunawardena, who was the deputy chairman of John Keels Holdings. And John Keels Holdings, as you all are aware, is like the government of Sri Lanka, in the sense that it owns a, a wide range of companies. Uh, in a diverse set of fields, um, including financial services, retail, hotels, logistics, and so on and so forth. The list is almost as, as large as the, the SOE list that Advocata has in their report. Um, we also have with us um, Roshan Pereira, who worked for many years at the Central Bank in many leadership positions there. Um, she also uh, is, serves on the board of a number of private sector companies and is a senior research fellow at Advocata. Um, she also, a few years back, spearheaded some of the efforts to centralize ownership functions at the Ministry of Finance. So we very much look forward to hearing from her. Uh, and then we have Rohan Samarajiva, who has for many years been engaged with SOEs in various capacities as Director General of Telecommunications at a time when uh, telecoms was really sizzling. There were huge changes in the market structure, in regulation, and so on and so forth. And then he was also the chairman of the ICTA, the ICTA agency, and has also served in other advisory and operational capacities in relation to uh, economic liberalization. And uh, as, as well, he is the founder chairman of Learn Asia. So we look very much forward to, to learning from these particular experiences. Um, and I think each of the panelists is going to bring a different perspective um, to, the, to, to this. And I'd like to start with Ajit.
thank you, Daniel. Uh, I can assure you that uh, John Keels is nothing like the government of Sri Lanka. Uh, John Keels doesn't have a situation where a company owes another company money to the tune of $300 million, like Sri Lankan owes CPC, or the same with CEB or, or, uh, having to pay $60 billion, making essentially CPC bankrupt. Um, you don't have situations where we have overstaffing, or that at least when I was there, I'm, I can't speak to the current context. Uh, I'm out of the place for almost five years or people who are highly overpaid and unproductive. Now the reason, the reason for this, and I think that's what uh, you want to hear from me, is whatever my experiences uh, in terms of how we operated that organization at that time. Uh, and there is a simple reason, and I think there are people here who, are, who have experienced uh, similar experiences as well, but I will just uh, I'll bring this out so that we can have a discussion thereafter. The first reason is that there is governance from the top. I mean that whatever you do, if you don't have governance from the top, nothing will work. And governance is not simply a written document of a governance uh, uh, program. It is actually living the 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 uh, fundamental values of governance. And that is given. Without that, nothing will work. Okay. The second is that the organization, these organizations that run on, on this basis in a professional manner, all of them, I mean, I'm not necessarily talking John Keels, it's all of them, uh, have a operating model that has been designed with a lot of thought uh, a lot of input, um, and is literally cast in stone. So an operating model will, is not designed around an individual or a group of individuals. It is essentially the, uh, how the company will operate. And it will go, it will start from, uh, it will have uh, the details of how the holding company will interact with the subsidiary companies. It will have details of what are the uh, benchmarks required to, to uh, obtain capital, so capital allocation methods. It will have HR processes documented so that you ensure that we don't get into the situation of overstaffing and being overpaid. Um, you um, the, the, um, it will go down to the detail of the meeting structures at every level, from the holding company to the subsidiary companies to the management teams. Agendas are pre-agreed. Attendance, mandatory attendance, is of the people, the designations are pre-agreed. Schedules are done well in advance so that meetings are held, and it's absolutely mandatory that these meetings get, get uh, held and are attended by the relevant people based on the agendas that have been, the minimum agenda that has been put into place. And the minutes of these meetings are available at a push of a button all the way up the chain. So it becomes so that monitoring, et cetera, is, is clear. So it's a it's a it's a it's all to do with process, discipline, and so on, which then results in predictability and so on in, in, in these organizations. Now I'll just expand a little bit in, in one area and uh, which is the capital allocation business. Uh, a holding company Certainly is, the, is where one is able to raise capital, and that's what the company that I was involved in did quite a lot. We, we raised money there at that level, and then obviously you have to allocate it to the businesses uh, that, you, that, that come under it. 
So you don't, without complicating it too much, obviously you go down the route of uh, detailed project evaluations, company pr uh, plan uh, annual planning, and so on and so forth. But return on equity is the key. You don't give your return on equity, you don't get the money. Um, if it's a project that is starting from scratch, execution of the project will be tracked, there will be dashboards that will be tracked by not only the people who are executing it, but all the way up, people are held answerable and accountable. Uh, and, and, and it is the, the discipline of managing and monitoring this is considered to be very, very important. People are held accountable, always. No passing the buck, you're accountable. The, um, so the, uh, all of this, as I said, has to be wrapped around the governance and risk management uh, uh, model that has to be in place. You have to ensure that you have the checks and balances. Uh, boards will be appointed by nomination committees to ensure that you have the right structure in the board. Uh, being a public company, majority would be independent. Um, the tenure of a board member is fixed, it doesn't go on forever. Um, the, uh, so that there is churn and that you, en you ensure that uh, different ideas and thoughts keep, keep coming in. When companies are at the subsidiary level uh, on an annual basis, profitable companies will not be allowed, or where there is cash flow coming in, are not allowed to keep their cash flow. Other than what is required for their capex with the right mix of debt and equity, everything else is upstream to the holding company. So nothing is kept. Uh, within any of these entities. They have to be run uh, in a nimble manner. They have to be, run, be lean uh, and always be sort of somewhat hungry. Uh, you don't allow cross-company lendings. You do not allow that. Each one financially has no choice but to stand on their own. They do not rely on corporate guarantees or director guarantees or any such thing. They end up having to stand on their own based on their balance sheet, their business plan, and raise their own funds. If a guarantee or a letter of comfort for the holding company is required, which at times may be required depending on the uh, type of project that you're getting into, it will be for a limited time frame. In that time frame, you have the entity is expected to perform to release that uh, liability. And if not, that will be scrutinized. It will get under the microscope and be scrutinized and evaluated. And if it's not going to be able to stand on its own, essentially it will be closed down. Um, so the I mean, that is essentially, at a, at a high level, I mean, obviously there are a lot of other synergies that are brought in through shared services and, you know, of legal and finance and so on, so that you bring in a lot of efficiency into the, into the system. But in a nutshell, that's, that's how uh, a, a public-listed company with multiple subsidiaries operates. Thank you very much, Ajit, for that uh, overview of how a private sector holding company operates. And uh, before we move on to Roshan, who will talk about how uh, the problems that SOEs face and some of the ways in which we might overcome them, I just want to remind the audience that there is a Slido where you can ask questions and the panelists will be responding to them after their presentations. Roshan, over to you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, so before going on to uh, discussing actually the, the experience that uh, we had in Sri Lanka of trying to set up something like a company, I want to go back and first look at what are the problems that you're trying to address uh, through these different mechanisms uh, that, that, that were proposed. 
Uh, I think some of these were already discussed in, in the last few presentations, but I'll just sort of run through them. So the, one of the main problems that we have in terms of SOEs is that uh, there's a conflict uh, in the role of the, of the government, both as a regulator and as an operator. Uh, so, and there are many examples of this. Basically, you have the shipping industry, the airline industry, energy, telecommunications. I mean, basically, most financial services, I mean, most of the industries that we're talking about, where the government is operating, it is also the regulator of that industry. And what happens is then, uh, it, it, uh, it uh, prevents there being a level playing field uh, between uh, these SOEs and the uh, private sector companies uh, that are also operating in the same field uh, because they get certain regulatory exemptions, uh, they get most favored status. Uh, we know with SLIC, uh, the, in the, the insurance industry, they were supposed to um, uh, separate their life and general insurance, but SLIC was exempted from that. That's, that's just one example. And this is basically, the, there are many examples uh, in terms of the, this, this sort of overlap between the regulator and the operator. The second one is in terms of the conflicts of the incentives of government. Uh, so due to welfare concerns, the government uh, decides to provide goods and services at subsidized rates. So this whole thing of public service obligations. Um, but at what cost? Basically, it's at the cost of the taxpayer. Um, they're using the taxpayer's money to, um, to, to subsidize these, these, uh, these SOEs. Um, so unlike a business enterprise, as you were saying, uh, they have a, you have a powerful in incentive, really, to ensure that uh, you create value for a shareholder, and, and, and you cannot. Uh, there is no, uh, no question about uh, um, being loss-making, and if you are, basically you're shut down. Uh, but in, in the case of these SOEs, because of this whole principal agent problem, you have a uh, government which is you know, uh, supporting an SOE, and uh, there is no incentive for the managers or the, or, the, or the people who are, you know, uh, given the responsibility to manage these SOEs to uh, ensure that they um, make profits or, or, or that they are profitable. Uh, the other thing is that the uh, government also has a problem in that uh, they end up trying to bail out these SOEs, right? Because sometimes uh, there are institutions which are too big to fail. Uh, so as a result, the government comes in and tries to be, or too, it's actually too politically sensitive to fail. Uh, and hence, the government comes, uh, bails out this, these SOEs. So that's the, it's a conflict between the shareholder who is the government and also the various objectives, other welfare objectives that they have. The other one is actually there's, there are complex governance, governance structures, and I think Daniel uh, showed that in, in his presentation, where you have multiple principles. Uh, you have the boards, you have the ministries, the parliamentary committees, uh, and this leads to a lot of confusion and also lack of accountability. Uh, and, and as a result, it weakens the monitoring uh, because these SOEs are accountable to, you know, so many different agencies. Uh, and this is further compounded by the board of directors who are very often political appointees um, uh, and as a result are, are more, uh, have more of a, uh, they're beholden to whoever has appointed them rather than to the, uh, the citizens who are really the, the shareholders. I mean, it's government, but it's the citizens who are the shareholders of, the, of these companies. The other one is that there are multiple legislation uh, surrounding these SOEs. So as, as uh, Daniel pointed out, there are SOEs that are companies, there are somehow corporations, uh, some are uh, uh, incorporated under acts of parliament. Uh, so there are different, uh, account, uh, different uh, legislation that... Uh, uh, SOE is subject to, which be also creates a lot of confusion, and, and there are conflicts within those. Uh, and finally, basically, this whole thing of lack of transparency and reporting, and, and, and I think Ajit um, talked about, because in a, in a private company, I mean, particularly if you're a listed company, uh, there is no, uh, you, you have to uh, uh, list your, you have to disclose, uh, make disclosures, you have to have reporting at regular intervals, Whereas in these public uh, the SOEs, um, there is a huge lacuna in information, and I think that Ravi uh, sh uh, pointed to that in his presentation, how difficult it is to get information. On, and some of these are key SOEs whose turnover is probably a few times larger than John Keel's. 
So we are saying John Keels is like a conglomerate. Uh, it is a conglomerate, which is as, but actually there are SOEs whose turnover is actually larger than John Keels. And there must be, it, it is more the reason why we should hold them accountable and ensure that they report. So this lack of transparency is another huge problem, uh, which again is due to the way these SOEs have formed. So, and, and, and we know the problem with all that is basically they've, the losses that we've incurred. I mean, if you look at the losses in 2021, they are, what, 270-something billion. Uh, so many times the education, nearly as much as your education budget, about uh, five times your Samudhi budget, or we're talking about social safety nets, it's almost five times that. So can we afford to continue in this format or, or continue running these SOEs in this way? And that's why I think we need to look at a different uh, structure in terms of uh, the uh, ownership structure and accountability mechanism uh, for this issue. Thank you very much. Um, Rohan, over to you. So, okay. Thank you. Um, I've been writing about this for some time, and uh, it's one of these moments when, uh, you know, it's easy to criticize. But I think now we are in a position where we have to stop criticizing and come up with actual solutions. So I'm in a difficult position because I've been uh, sort of absolutist on some matters and I have to moderate my position. Now, one thing we know, I think, from everything you heard from the morning is that we can't go on like we are going on now. That is not an option. So we have to do something. Now, the question is, what is the the problem we are trying to solve, right? Because the title of uh, state centralized control of ownership functions suggests that we are going to keep them as state-owned companies, but we are going to manage them in a centralized manner. So what are we trying to do here? It seems to me that from all the conversations that we've had so far, what we are trying to do is we are trying to make them more efficient and we are trying to make them l not lose this much money, right? When I say more efficient, it's not simply rate of return or, re or return on, on equity, but also that they provide better service to the public, right? So one reason why we haven't been able to do that is because of the, the fact that they have multiple objectives and some of them contradictory. I can remember Mr. Mahindra Rajapaksa once saying uh, that the electricity board should not be making profits because it's a service organization, right? So he was basically saying their job is not to make profits but to do something else, right? So um, he may not, not be correct, but those kinds of confusions exist. Uh, and then, of course, this whole question that Ajit talked about, which is governance and the rot starting at the top which is we don't appoint the right kinds of direct people to the boards. They come there for the Chinese role and the, the, the tea, and then they go away, collect the meeting fee, and they go away. They don't really pay much attention. Uh, you sit there. You don't make a fuss. You keep coming. Uh, and, and then it goes down, which is you concede all kinds of things to the to the management and then the management concedes to the employees and the unions and so it goes. It starts at the top and the rot goes right down. So these possibly are the, the, the problems we are trying to solve and maybe there is this other question that there are some that by their very existence they distort the markets that they are in. So I would argue that the state banks don't allow our banking sector to perform optimally. I would argue that the fact that Sri Lanka Telecom is state-owned has got a certain negative effect on the telecom sector as a whole, right? Now, <clears throat> is, now, so that is the problem. I think we can all agree more or less on the problem. What are the solutions? Is it taking these 500 plus state-owned enterprises and dumping them under a single holding company? Right? When you say that, so we should have a holding company under which we have the Development Lotteries Board, 
Lanka mineral sands, that is the people who collect the, the, the stuff that is getting washed up from the Indian Ocean and selling it to various uh, entities. Sri Lanka Cashew Corporation, State Pharmaceuticals Corporation, National Lotteries Board, uh, Ayurvedic Drugs Corporation, Sri Lanka Transport Board. Are we really going to dump all these under one company and say that that holding company should have the authority to appoint all the director boards, should have the authority to decide on their capital requirements, and have sort of disciplinary control over them, and so on and so forth. I would tend to argue that that is going to be problematic, because there are very few transport companies in the world that actually make a profit. I think uh, Hong Kong does, and maybe one or two others, but otherwise they all lose money. They, are, they, are, they, are, they have a social purpose. So then I go back to Temasek, uh, which is an entity that I have studied at some length. And what Temasek says is that if there's any social purpose to this company, we won't take it. They are purely commercially oriented entities, like Singapore Airlines, like Singtel, the telco, and so on, right? So housing uh, companies, very large real estate owners and so on, are not under Temasek. So then you could get this clarity of objective. We are here to make money. Return on equity is a reasonable objective for these companies, right? So let's assume that that's something we need to consider rather than dumping everything under this same heading. Then, um, I, I would say that, uh, I wish this report was in your hands, you could go through this and see which ones do you want to include, right? The Mineral Sands Corporation, which is an extraordinary monopoly. Uh, you really don't have to do anything, you know, the sand just keeps washing up from the, the Ganges, and then you collect it and you sell it to somebody at whatever, you know, less whatever corruption uh, is involved, uh, and that's it, you can make profits. This here, uh, in this document, is given as a company with a good ROA, return on assets, right? Uh, then some of the plantation companies, I think again you could argue that that's sort of the company you could have under this, uh, this entity. But then you have the question, uh, my recollection of Kiel's is that despite all these comments made about them, they have focused. They got out of the plantation sector, they are in hospitality, they are in uh, food, processed food, and a few other things, but they're not, I mean, and logistics, I think, right? So you were once in more things and you got out. So it could be that we also have that kind of focus where there are certain synergies and there are some capabilities at that, the holding company level. Um, <clears throat> now, is the holding company allowed, like Temasek, to scale down? Because I've always thought, you know, when you have one of these companies, it must have the ability to discipline. So if one of the companies under the holding company is not making money, is not performing, is really annoying all the, consumer, the customers, uh, it's not making money and all these negative things are happening. Now you can fire the CEO. You can change the top management. But even then it's not getting fixed. Or you know, the market conditions have changed, they're getting enormous competition. Is it possible to, for the company to scale down its ownership stake or to get rid of it altogether like Kiel's did? Kiel's got rid of certain companies, right? On what basis, I don't know, but they got rid of it. Now, is that freedom going to be given to his company? Now, Temasek has it. When Temasek wants to, to get rid of something or scale down its ownership, they, they are free to do that. Then, how is that the really critical thing is, I think I agree with Ajit, you've got to start at the top. So how do we measure the performance of the holding company? That is the critical question. How do we measure the performance of the holding company? So the holding company, if it has got these measurable metrics on which it is held accountable, they say, oh my God, my return on assets, my return on uh, equity is bad. I need to do something about it. Let's dump this 
particular company that is dragging me down. Rohan, you have two more minutes. Okay, I'm almost at the end. Um, <clears throat> so, um, are we going to give them that freedom to to do that? And 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 the more important thing is, what are the metrics? Now, in the case of uh, companies like Temasek, uh, you have a extreme and. Well, they have certain, you know, stock market performance and how the shares are doing and so on. And from many conversations that I've had, we really might not be able to pull that off, have uh, share performance as a criterion. Uh, some companies could be doing well just because they're a monopoly. I mean, Lanka, I mean, whatever, the phosphates, a mineral science company. It doesn't really take them to be very efficient to make money. They are absolute critical monopoly, right? Uh, but is that uh, that kind of effect on the market that they want to keep a monopoly in order to provide? You'll now have the holding company becoming a proponent of monopolies and market uh, market exclusion, right? Or of influencing the regulators, uh, which is a bad thing that we all agree on, and. <clears throat> The last question, which is the one that really breaks me up, is how do we make sure that this super board doesn't go the way of all the other super boards that we have put in place in this country? I mean, there was the Greater Colombo Economic Commission headed by, by uh, Upali Vijayvardhana, and you know, big shot, and it was extraordinary. People thought it was very good. I don't know. I'm, what, what, what is your opinion about the performance of the BOI, this super uh, body that we were we had set up? Uh, what is your opinion about the port city, whatever controlling body, this super authority that we set up? Did we appoint the right people? Are they beyond reproach? Are they the best people for the job? And what are the performance metrics that we have for them? So if we create another one of these, we won't have these performance metrics. And then what we will do, given the culture of our country, is that we will say that they need to be appointed by the Constitutional Council. That's about what we'll do. They won't hold them accountable in any way. We'll say they've got to be appointed by the Constitutional Council, and that's good. But will they be really a super board? Will they be effective? Right? So finally, my conclusion. I don't think we have a single working solution. It's going to be like, um, as uh, Deng Xiaoping said, crossing the river by feeling the stones. I think we have to take some coherent companies, put them under centralized ownership, see how that works. What the Thai speaker, the keynote speaker said today about a supervisory body that doesn't take ownership but exercise supervision, we have another set that will do that kind of thing. So I think we need to have three or four solutions and see which one works and then expand that solution rather than put all these things into a single centralized board. Thank you very much. So before I open the floor to questions, I've got a, a question of my own for each one of the panelists. Starting with where Rohan left off, crossing the river by feeling the stones. We've been crossing that river since 1977. Um, so we've learned quite a few things along the way. And each one of you has had your own experience um, in, in crossing those rivers in various capacities. And we've also had some ideas on ownership functions. What are the key, key things that need to be done? Um, is it centralizing ownership in a holding company? Is it improving disclosure requirements and governance, uh, for example, by listing on the stock exchange? Is it breaking up? bodies to prevent conflicts of interest. For example, in the ports where the ports authority is the, is the owner of the port, it is the operator of a terminal, um, it uh, is the regulator, it also sits on the board of its competitors uh, in, the, in the form of SAGT and CICT. Um, so if, with all these ideas, the question I have for each one of the panelists is, if you had to pick one ownership function or, or one of these solutions, uh, to implement, which one would it be and why? Shall I go first? Okay. So I, I also want to respond to what Rohan said. Uh, I, I agree with a lot of what you said, actually. Uh, uh, and, and this was tried in 2015. We actually tried to set up something like a centralized uh, ownership function. 
Uh, so the the objective. So I'll start with the objective. The objective was really to have this arm's length relationship with SOEs, because at the moment what you find is that because of the multiple um, principles, multiple agencies uh, around the SOEs, there's a lot of confusion. So you have the line ministries, you have the Ministry of Finance. Uh, at the time that I was there, you had the Ministry of Public Enterprises, uh, and and basically, and you have this the the bodies in uh, Parliament, uh, and there's a lot of confusion in terms of who's giving uh, directions or who's giving um, uh, uh, yeah guiding these SOEs. So I think the whole idea of setting up this centralized um, uh, function or a centralized body was really to remove. Uh, the SOEs from that confused, confusing structure, and this centralized body was going to act as the uh, sort of the, the go between, uh, if you like, between the SOEs and the the political masters, uh, and basically to ensure that the SOEs were ring fenced from political interference. Um, so, um, in 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 that context, basically this. Public Enterprise Board uh, was was proposed. In fact, the legislation was also uh, drawn up. Unfortunately, it never saw a light of day. Hopefully, we can maybe resurrect it. But but in that legislation, I mean, one of the things that we tried to do is it was not a thing of bringing everything into the into this so into this uh, Public Enterprise Board. It was very much a case of uh, case by case. Uh, dealing with some of the low-hanging fruit first, uh, some of the easier to do things, because all, you know that there's a lot of obviously um, uh, uh, vested interest in terms of who are uh, dealing with these SOEs. Uh, so it was, you know, you try, try trial and error, and then you 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 find your feet. Uh, so so the, basically, the function of the public enterprise board was really to. Uh, uh, allow the SOEs to be independent in terms of their strategizing and also have operational independence. Because right now, because they're directly under the ministries, uh, there's a lot of you know directions coming from the ministries. And that was hopefully, they the tried to eliminate that through this, um, through this structure. The second one, of course, was of course this prof professionalization of boards and the management of SOEs, uh, because this this public enterprise board, uh, which was yeah, there was a structure in how how uh, it was going to be appointed, but basically that they would uh, create a pool of resources, a pool of people from which they would pick uh, who would be appointed onto these boards, and it had they had to have minimum qualifications, uh, experience, um, in and. Only based on that would they allowed to be, or, or they would be able to be appointed to these boards. So, in you, you were going to take away this whole thing of political appointments of boards. And the third one is, of course, the monitoring of performance. So, I think that is one thing that, um, in terms of governance, I think that that is what I should have started with actually. So, this whole thing was really to improve the governance framework. Um, I, I don't think you can, you know, run before you walk. We have to go step by step. So first thing is really to improve governance. And I think Ajit alluded to that, that unless you have a proper governance structure, you can't do a lot of these things. So the whole point of this really, the first step was really to improve the governance framework within these SOEs. Uh, so so the, the, the SOEs had to regularly report, uh, or, uh, send in reports. So there was going to be a regular reporting structure uh, to the Public Enterprise Board uh, and and um, as well as disclosures, and, and if necessary, uh, to insist that some of them were also listed on the stock exchange, because that provides a very good, um, uh, that, that enforces or forces these SOEs to have to uh, disclose uh, at, on the stock exchange. Uh, the other one was also they had to have, um, uh, so, so basically these were some of the, some of the sort of the ideas that were uh, incorporated into this legislation, and the, and the point of it was basically to minimize or to eliminate these multiple authorities, uh, to make them more competitive, productive, performance oriented, uh, critically to reduce the burden of the taxpayer. So they were, had to start uh, turning around their business or their uh, operations, 
improve service delivery because i don't think we talk about that we talk a lot about the losses but how about the quality of service because a lot of these soes really are major inputs into every other in that inefficiency is is fed into all the other industries as well so service delivery was also very important and also this creating this level playing field um, so so the first thing was really converting so it was a stage by stage step by step sort of process the first was basically to convert these into profitable at least to make them profitable or not loss making and then see whether you can go to the next steps of um, divestment or whatever or, or having joint ventures or whatever the other structures but the first step was really to improve the governance structure and make them at least stop ble- the bleeding from these entities So if you had to pick one change in the ship functions that you would make um a low hanging fruit or priority area what would that be so, if you had to pick one change yeah. what would that be uh, yeah so i think it, the first thing is really that you have to uh, the, the appointment to the boards of these soes needs to be an independent a- entity because i think finally if the board is independent and operates in an independent fashion i think that changes because again it's 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 the tone from the top right who who the governance structure i think that will be a game changer right yeah um yeah i think um to answer your question directly is that uh there is no structure that the can you can put into place to make it work so government must not own any business that's it whichever way you look at it it's rotten at the top it's rotten to the core they cannot own a business and i'll give you some examples i'll give you some examples of why i'm saying this it's not just making a profound sort of uh, statement or any sort uh rohan brought in the plantations as an example so we may recollect some of you will recollect the plantations were a huge problem for government up to the mid 90s uh when the privatization program began it was a massive problem continuous uh support from the budget was required because they were running enormous losses a labor force that was eternally on strike and using i mean the half a million labor force or whatever at that time was being was used for political gain from you know for uh switching parties and uh, you know sometimes even appointing governments it was a never ending process the productivity was low i mean it was everything that you can see now in the current failed or failing government institutions was there in these plantation companies and it was there for many years from the time it was nationalized in the 70s until the privatizations um then the privatization was done the plantations were bought there are people here who were part of that including john keels at that stage to this day they haven't gone back to government for any support whatsoever we sold because we had certain a uh, minimum thresholds of roes and so on and that that's a different those are each individuals uh, entity that owned it would do that and there are companies who have there was a there were parties who were willing to buy it. and these plantation companies some have changed hands but they have, they still remain with the private sector investment has been made significant investment has been made into the sector they are funded independently no government support whatsoever the 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 quality of life of the people who are working in the sector has improved from what it was they are viable entities and this is now almost 20 years since privatization and they are functioning as they are contributing to the economy the valuable economic assets of the country i mean that is a classic example of why government should not be in business and that's the only model the way i see it now so uh 
that's Ajit's department. I'm not going to get in there. Uh, I'm going to kind of do a variation on something that my friends at the Hatalistuna Balaka, the 43 Brigade, have come up with, which is they want to do a management audit of all the state-owned enterprises. What I'm saying is, you know, you can do a management audit, but take a subset and actually run an experiment with a subset. Put them under a common holding company, put hard budget constraints on them, say that they cannot be given any kind of favorable uh, loans from government uh, entities or whatever. Get companies that have a single focus, uh, a single objective, that don't have all these social objectives and, and uh, economic objectives mixed up. Uh, let the, the, the top uh, holding company make all the appointments. Let them fire these people without any mercy. Um, let them also give the holding company the right to partially or fully privatize these companies if they are not behaving the way they should be behaving. I think that is a much stronger way, and I, I recall some conversations I used to have in the 80s with my Yugoslav socialist friends about hard budget constraints on state-owned enterprises. So what I'm saying is let's make hard budget constraints real, at least for this subset. Let's do something else with the other ones, and then we'll see if this model is working. We can bring more people into this model. So there's a question on uh, qualifications, presumably for board directors and key management personnel. KPIs, standardized KPIs to cover all, all enterprises, and um, also the process in which these sort of uh, initiatives are introduced to a, a company or a set of companies. Ajit, perhaps you could touch upon the experience in the private sector and, and how that could relate to SOE reform in particular in terms of these ownership control functions. So, sorry, so the question is about boards or the... The question return? is about qualifications for boards. KPIs, standardized KPIs for all uh, group companies um, and the reporting associated with that. And then the transformation process by when these uh, companies that are unfamiliar with this, uh, how, how do you transform them to, to adopt these practices? Okay. So the transformation, you have to start somewhere, right? And then it starts moving. In terms of the qualifications uh, to, to, to be on the board, I mean, essentially you need people... Um, it's 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 not a paper qualification that you're really talking about. Right? I mean, all of that helps, but it's really really those with integrity, experience, and and who have the time to commit towards uh, focusing on uh, focusing on what the company has to achieve. Now, the KPIs uh, obviously have to depend are dependent. There is no standard KPI that you put across as the key as a key performance indicator for every company. Each one will be dependent on the industry they are in, on the comparators, on comp competition, and so on. Uh, and once that is, once you have gone through that, the board of directors has to, have to discuss that debate, that have the expertise to understand what these industries can, can do. But you could have situations where, I mean, our, say ROE is obviously a, 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 a key indicator. And, and, uh, and, and a must. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you just say there's a standard ROE of 15% or, or some number like that. You know, you could have a situation where an ROE of 80% may not be adequate because it could be a, a company that has a, low knee, a, a lower equity requirement and you, you, it has to be benchmarked against com, uh, uh, competitors. So, so it's an evolving thing, this whole KPI thing. But the the whole the, the, it's important to ensure that there is a reward structure that aligns uh, aligns everybody towards this end game the end goal and that that reward that reward structure has to be uh, has to go all the way down in the organization so so that you're not just you're not reliant simply on a fixed wage uh, inflation adjusted plus uh, plus a, a premium on an annual basis. But you need to ensure that the incentives are, are, are linked to uh, what, uh, your, your performance in relation to all the stakeholders. And this is not only the, the stakeholder of the shareholder, it would be the, your employees, your, 
your the the uh, the environment you're working in and, and all of that so the kpis would be would be all, would be would include would be all encompassing but uh it's a reward structure that is really important to ensure that everybody is aligned so there are a couple of questions on the politics of, of SOE reform. There's concerns that a Temasek model would not work uh, in Sri Lanka because of the politics in terms of appointment of directors. There's also questions uh, related to the politics of hard budget constraints. Now, the reward structure is very clear for ISOEs. Ministers and politicians get rewarded, and so do their supporters. How do we change this, Rohan? I mean, that was the, 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 the story that I was telling about Temasek those days was that I said, you know, in the end, an uh, extremely highly qualified woman um, was heading Temasek, and her name was Ho Ching, and she just happened to be married to the Prime Minister. And I would actually put it in that order. I don't think she was appointed because she was the Prime Minister's wife. Um, but that allowed them to kind of ride out some of the... the any company has ups and downs and bad years and good years and so on. Um, and they also had um, external directors. You know, they had Robert Zolik, from, who was former World Bank guy who was brought in as a director and so on. So I think you need to get that kind of flavor to this. And in fact, uh, to his credit, I would say that Dr. P. B. Jayasundra uh, even had this idea for the Port City uh, board. And that got shut down that, you know, it, there's going to be international advertising and people would be recruited to be the, the governing body for the port city. Uh, it's very difficult in this country to get that kind of board set up, right? Because this is a trust-based, patronage-based... But there was a time, for example, when the CEO of People's Bank was, a, was an international. That was, a <laughs> that was a, uh, intentionally done so that they wouldn't keep giving loans to various cronies, right? And the fellow got growled, right? His, he was surrounded and, you know, I mean, he was there for that reason. And there are other countries that have done that. I mean, uh, both Hong Kong and Singapore uh, got uh, telecom regulators who are foreigners because they wanted to, to get the regulator to project independence, uh, which a local person may not have in, a, in those small societies. Uh, so those are going to be real challenges, uh, I think, uh, getting over the politics of it, which, which is why I'm, very, I'm skeptical about taking the Temasek model, because I've been going back to that. You know, that whole meritocracy-based culture that is existing, or it appears to exist in Singapore, allows these kinds of things to be done in a proper way, while our culture is almost diametrically opposed. Hence, why government should not be in business. Since we're almost up for time, I'm going to give each of the panelists two minutes for any closing remarks. Uh, so just to go back to that, uh, I, I'll just give our experience with, the, with this public enterprise board. Uh, we spent many hours working on it. The legislation was also drafted, but never saw light of day and again it's because of this problem that there's so much of vested interest in terms of trying to you know separate uh, these SOEs from the ministries the uh, etc so it, it's not easy to do but I think in this situation particularly in this crisis we need to use this crisis and I think many countries have used crises to uh, to to do this kind of reform uh, because uh, I think we have to understand that these are public assets, and it's not uh, the per not not the possession or, or belongs to you know any any political party or any government, but it is public assets, and I think that's where the public needs to really uh, put a lot of um, sort of pressure to to make sure that this kind of reform gets through. Uh, um, Yes, you're going to face oppositions from even within uh, you know, the public because you have trade unions, you have people, employees uh, will be affected. But I think that has to be done. Uh, the other one I want to say is that basically, even if you have a good corporate governance structure, and I think uh, Ajit alluded to that, basically you can't regulate 
corporate governance. I mean, it has to come from within. Uh, so the culture really matters. Uh, and unless we change this cult culture, uh, you know, it will be just uh, getting another institution in place. Uh, and it may not really uh, have the benefits or the, 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 what, what we really intend to achieve through it. Um, yeah, so I mean, I'll just reiterate what I said. Obviously, the governance factor is crucial. I don't trust politics. Politics will, even if, you, even if we use this crisis, which we should use to, to make changes over time, as we have seen over the last 40, 50 years, uh, politicians will try to claw back the influence and power that they've got. So I think here is the chance to actually get out of business. Uh, which, and, and that I think is, should be the absolute priority. Um, the example of the plantation sector is just one. I can, the other one is take the, the port sector. Ports was a, a monopoly of the government. And in a crisis, during the cri a crisis, they, uh, they did went down the privatization. That's when SAGT was born, and now CICT is there. Is there a need? The only, only reason J JCT is there is to employ 20,000 people. There's really no need to have JCT uh, being run by the government. So have a strong regulator. Obviously, the regulation is important. There should be a strong regulator, and that is what the, any government should do. And you can, you can pro do it in a very professional way, as, as Rohan mentioned. But essentially, uh, I think this is the chance uh, to, to push uh, the government to get out of, of business. I think we have to begin from a realistic assessment of state capacity in 2022. So you see, there are many other friends of mine not only Ajit, who would say, privatize everything. You see, back then in the 90s, we had a specialized organization called PERC that handled privatizations. They were well-paid, highly qualified people, protected from political influence, etc. We had the Board of in Infrastructure Investment, which is again a kind of an elite organization. We had the National Procurement Agency. You had my operation, which was a tiny little thing compared to everything else, called the Public Interest Program Unit, which was 10 people and a 5 million US dollar credit, technical assistance credit, right? All that is gone. Mahindra Rajapaksa dismantled every single one of them. There's no capacity in the state to privatize anything today. There's no capacity. So, what are we going to do? So, when I say, take out Sri Lankan, right? Unbundling the, the, the ground handling, which I think is extraordinarily important. Even for that, we'll have to get some external help, right? So I think we need to, to, to look at it realistically and say that's what can be done. We can take out one or two for now and build up the capacity to engage in transparent, high quality transactions. Otherwise, we'll have a mess. Second stage, because we've got to do something with the rest of them, put a subset of them into a holding company, a small holding company. Don't overreach and do the kind of things that I talked about. Hard budget constraints, them ab having the ability to fire people up and down the company and so on and so forth. Third, let's take the public and price department and give them a manageable chunk and say, can you guys do that like Thailand does, like somebody else does, a supervisory body letting the system operate, but you guys kind of guide them? We'll see which one works. And then we'll move them from one category to another. Well, thank you very much to our panelists, and have a very good evening. Now conference organized by Advocata Institute Sri Lanka and this is under the theme of Sri Let's Reset Sri Lanka and talking about today's day one conference as you know we started it successfully with a keynote speech from the president of the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka Mr. Ranil Vikramasinghe and um, there onwards 
uh, taking from his words, I think it was a very successful conference, very successful start as a foundation to the conference. And there onwards, we moved into learning from others, learning from the success stories. And the very first story we shared was learning from the Thailand's reform experience after the Asian financial crisis in 1997. I think we have a lot to learn from them as well as they have uh, come back to their stability right now from a crisis. And then we move forward to talk about air India privatization story. We learned a lot from them as well uh, from that session. And from there, the a presentation showcasing air, air India privatization and also, we discussed in parallel whether Sri Lankan Airlines is ready to be privatized or not. Taking forward from that session, ladies and gentlemen, we went into talking about resetting Samurti. A presentation on Sri Lanka's current social safety net was discussed and also the way forward was discussed in the session today. And Following that session, we had a very important session on taxation, stability, and growth. And in between these sessions, as you are aware, we were having fruitful conversations and interviews at the live studio. We had a chat with the COO of Advocata Institute, uh, Mr. Dananath Fernando. And there onwards, we also launched, we shouldn't forget the milestone that uh, Advocata Institute stepped into today, that is the launch of the SOE web platform and also the state of state of um state of the SOE in Sri Lanka report, the 2022 report, and also the other report on SOE cons uh, governance and consolidation plans. Uh, setting that forward, we also had a discussion with one of the research assistants at Advocata Institute, that is Miss Anuka uh, Ratnayaka. So uh, putting my extending, extending my thank you to all the people who joined with us today. As you know, throughout this session, we kept talking to policymakers, international experts, thought leaders, business community, the civil society, and most importantly, the collaboration of us citizens of Sri Lanka is important to reset the country, Sri Lanka. And the final session today was very important. I think most of you enjoyed and it was a very fruitful conversation on centralizing the state's ownership functions. And this is, ladies and gentlemen, the very first day of the conference reform now organized by Advocata Institute under the theme, let's reset Sri Lanka. And this we are now coming into the final act, that is, we are ready to conclude day one. But don't forget, we have day two. So tomorrow, we hope to join you by 9 o'clock sharp in the morning to uh, start, it, start tomorrow's conference. We have something very important. As you know, throughout this conference, we are putting forward reforms how to reset Sri Lanka, because we kept talking about how, as Sri Lankans, how we all should gather, not just the decision makers. Don't, we shouldn't just blame the authorities. We shouldn't put it on the leaders of the country. But as individuals, as citizens, as responsible citizens of Sri Lanka, we should all take the responsibility of resetting Sri Lanka. So are you ready? I think I am. So taking this forward, tomorrow we're starting, we hope to start the conference under the topic debt crisis, structural adjustment and trade policy. So stay tuned for tomorrow and tomorrow's lineup I shall bring to you tomorrow morning. So as you join tomorrow, uh, I would like to, before winding up, I would like to remind you on the sponsors as well who has made this event a great success. So reminding the sponsors, as the platinum sponsor, we have... Gold sponsor, we have Expo Lanka. As the silver sponsors, we have M2M Veranda Services, John Keels Group, and John Keels Properties. And as the event partner, we have FNF, Jetwing Hotels, and Atlas Network. And I shall also remind you tomorrow also, you can join with us our live streaming, uh, just like people have uh, taken their tickets and join us physically. Due to the limitations, we are having this conference hybrid. So as you're joining our live stream, let me remind you the live streaming platforms. You can join us through SL Vlog, politics.lk, Sri Lanka Students for Liberty, The Morning, The Sunday Morning, Daily FT, Other, Economy and Business Sri Lanka, businessnews.lk, and through Citizen. And also, I should not forget to remind you about the social media platforms of Advocata Institute, because this discussion does not stop from this conference. We should keep 
talking about it, we should take forward the results uh, in the future as well. So Advocata Institute will keep us informed and updated about the content. So to stay tuned, these are the social media platforms of Advocata Institute Sri Lanka to remind you. They are on Facebook under the arms Advocata Institute as Advocata Plus and also Advocata Kural. And coming into their LinkedIn, they have the arm Advocata Institute on LinkedIn. On Twitter, you can find them as Advocata Institute, Advocata Plus. And on YouTube, you can find them as Advocata Institute and Advocata Plus. On TikTok, Advocata LK and Advocata Plus. And on Instagram, as Advocata LK. So ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned with for more content and to, for updates as well. So successfully, we are ready to conclude the day one of Reform Now Conference organized by Advocata Institute Sri Lanka under the theme, Let's Reset Sri Lanka. Just like I started, are you ready to reset Sri Lanka? Join tomorrow as well. See you tomorrow. Signing off from the live streaming studio, I am Ashing Sani Veerasinghe. Have a good evening.